An aid worker's personal security is impacted by where the aid worker is, who they are, and their role and organization. Organizations have a duty of care to take all reasonable measures to protect their staff from foreseeable risks, including those that emerge due to personal characteristics. I am Tara Arthur with the Global Interagency Security Forum. Join us as we explore the interplay between inclusivity and security risk management. Hi, Mo. How are you today? Hi, Tara. What a lovely way to start the year. Thanks for making this call. Absolutely. Well, we're really excited to have this opportunity to speak with you today and invite you into this conversation we're having about inclusivity and security risk management. So I think it would be great if we can start off with hearing a little bit about yourself and what you've been doing around these issues. Oh, fantastic. I mean, one thing I wanted to start with was, well, I'm also on my own journey of, of continuous sort of self-improvement and 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 trying to be a better person myself. We all make mistakes and I create a ripple effect of how I can be better. I hope I can then be a, you know, a better change maker in the world. I guess a little bit about my background. Like I've worked in the aid sector for 20 years. I sigh because it's like, oh no, I'm, I'm becoming that age now. And a lot, of the, a lot of it's been that the aid sector working across uh, charities, private sector, the UN, the usual, the usual bunch, mainly on like system strengthening strategy and senior management roles. So it's been a, been an interesting side. And I start with why I do this work now is that I found myself three years ago going, started with i just found myself surrounded by issues of it was all about value for money project effectiveness what does the donor want and i felt like we were like suffocating how we care about our employees about the people we work with and we just were so focused on trying to get the job done which which we have to do but we were forgetting about the other side and I'm not, surely I'm not the only person seeing this. And the areas of institutional racism or other institutional barriers were known, but we just weren't allowed to talk about them. And that was just sort of like sort of swept under the carpet. And that was painful at times because it meant you had to sort of question your own values of speaking up. A few years ago, I got together with a close colleague of mine, nothing to do with the AIDS sector, actually, bees. And we said, well, we need to look at innovation in a different way and, and actually look at innovation about people and how can we improve the mindset in the workplace. And a lot of that is about inclusive leadership, taking an anti-racist lens behind things and caring personally. Um, and this is, this is where we're at. And I found it really difficult to find spaces to, to talk about this and to, to think for myself. So that's why we created a community and moved away from like doing evaluations and moved towards um, trying to help people and organizations through their journey. And that's that's sort of where we're at now, where we're trying to, we're doing a bunch of coaching and coaching programs because not one person has all the answers to, to what we're doing. So, you know, that whole phrase like advice is for the advice giver, not for the not the receiver. So it's sort of like trying to unpack things for organizations for themselves. So that's sort of where we're at and, and why we're doing this. Yeah, I don't know if I've babbled for too long, probably. So I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop for a second. No, that's great. That's a really interesting background. And I think it's going to be a very good conversation we have today. And just to kind of get us into this spirit of today's conversation, I think it would be really actually useful to set some some ground understanding of terminologies that you might commonly use when discussing race or ethnicity. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. There was a, there was a, there's a lot out there, isn't there? Like Jedi, DEI, EDI. Uh, a new one I came across was Abide, which was, if I remember correctly, advancing belonging, inclusion, diversity, and equity. So, I think yes, and then obviously down the. You can't see this on the podcast, but I'm going to put it in apostrophes, BAME, put apostrophes. So I, I, the, a top tip for you out there is that if you're using BAME, put it in apostrophes. I think the first place to start is like always ask people like what terms are the ones that are accepted, um, terms that are 
uh, used more more often in say the UK will be different to the to the US and checking in with the people to start with the people that you're working with is so so important and have the genuine intent to use the the correct words and take responsibility when it's not the right word as well um, or the right phrase I, I'd never use acronyms for example so if you're going to talk about a group of people I would talk say if I have to, I, I try not to say it at all, but you say black indigenous people of color instead of saying BIPOC. Uh, BAME is a no-no, do not use BAME. I'll send you a link um, on a great, Sh- Shireen Daniels, there's a great short seven minute video about terminology and how, where BAME has come from, because that's come from the UK civil service. Basically uh, the civil service thought we've got to put together a term that isn't white. So that's where it came from. So it's it's almost like another ring term by using it. So hence like using it in apostrophes when, when you see it in reports and so on. If I was going to use a term for a term for those that say are not from a white background, perhaps the global majority might be the right word. However, my top tip number three is like be specific. You know, we've got data for black communities in the UK, that's not going to be, we're going to talk about black people, it's about black communities in the UK. I'm of South Asian origin, so being as specific as possible for the groups that you're talking to. And I think it's quite obvious when people make mistakes and don't own it versus make mistakes and and try and cover up for it. So I'm, I always make mistakes. I might have made some, probably have done just talking to yourself. And that's okay if you if you just own it. And checking in so i'll check in with you now tara did i did i use anything that perhaps i shouldn't have as you are from a, a different a racial background to me well thank you for that question that's not been posed to me in such a way before and this series um i would say you've not in any way so thanks for that question <laughs> but i think you've raised some really interesting observations about the terms that you use and the way you describe things and the need to be specific And I think that that's really powerful. So thanks for sharing your reflections there. I'd love to take you a bit into a different direction with that as a base, a bit of our, your previous comments. So, you know, something that you have worked on quite a lot is the issue of creating psychological safety. So for security managers, it's essential to be able to, you know, create psychological safety with the staff they work with. And Often they're handling sensitive issues, you know, including incident management. So could you tell us a bit more about your work on this and what advice you might have for security managers to create psychological safety in such situations? Thanks, Tara. Yeah, it's a it's a subject close to my heart because I've my own lived experience. I, I've often felt like I couldn't speak up like in meetings or in situations where it's you know it is an all white you know uh, set of set of people in in a in a meeting in whitehall you sit there going am i meant to be in here am i meant to, what, is this the right meeting so i'm glad we're talking about this and we work with individuals and and groups like over a number of weeks to bring up psycho to to work on psychological safety it doesn't happen overnight a top tip to 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 any leaders out there and and including security leaders out there is the two books that to pick up is Promises of Giants by John, John Amici, OBE, and Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. Now, they might seem quite general, but there's some real awesome fundamentals about working with teams in an inclusive manner uh, in those two books. And I'll, I'll give you this for the show notes. And I think just like what this is all linked to is like, how do you help people be themselves without fear of negative consequences? And that's that's like the crux of it, isn't it? And I think that the, there's two sides to that. There's there's the person themselves, but also the group. And the group has to have, how do I put it, like be accountable for their impact of what they say and what they do, not their intention. A psychologically safe group doesn't say things like, oh, that's not what I meant to say. That's not the, you know, that, that wasn't my intent. It's like, it should be, oh, I'm sorry for the impact of what I've said. So there's a nuance of how the group works together. And you asked about advice. I hate I hate giving advice, but if I if I must, like there's sort of three levels, I'd say, as a, any leader, and especially a secure someone lead, leading security, because there's so many tough subjects out there, is like work on yourself first, like self-awareness, then work on the interaction your interactions with others, and then work on the interactions of your team. Don't I think we jump to number three quite quickly. We start working on the interaction of teams without reflecting on ourselves. 
um and i thought i'd pose some questions about about that like i think like three questions that come up like like how are you ensuring equal voices in meetings for example so that's number one question i'll just pause there just so in case you're scribbling it down um like really if listeners are probably scribbling that's like how are you ensuring equal voices in in any meetings the reason i ask that is that that's where you can start like seeing how safe people feel to speak up like how are people reacting to each other the other question I'd, I'd post is like, how are you as a person giving and receiving feedback? I, I think we really underestimate the power of how feedback affects psychological safety. If we all gave awesome feedback, we'd have such safer environments for people to speak up. And the last question is like, how do you receive criticism from others that you manage? That would be the third question, because if you're receiving that and not doing anything, or you're responding badly, the, when the big issues happen, yeah, they might not come to come to fruition. I think like, what was it? Do you know, I don't know. Do you with the classic phrase like, like, don't, don't, don't bring me issues, bring me solutions. When I was a team leader, I want the issues. I want the issues early. I want the small issues that the T isn't good enough, as well as the big issues. Like I remember, I was managing a remote team across Somalia and South Sudan, and like the organisation wasn't paying the locally let, locally contracted staff on time. Unless we sorted that out, nothing else is going to work well. Like they're not going to come to me with problems of like issues on the ground or like or like um, anything they've heard if we're not sorting out the their basics for them. If that's the thing, their challenge, and that's the criticism they're giving me, I need to sort that out. If I need to get to the other the stuff that's that you know the stuff that is uh, perhaps a bigger issue for the organization rather than the individual so that how like how you're receiving feedback how you're giving it is so so important and this isn't before you get to the big issues there is a analogy that um john amici uses which is like imagine a i was going to say a fag butt which is which is what you say in the uk before a cigarette butt has been thrown to the ground and no one deals with it and then imagine someone throws some litter out and no one deals with it. And then imagine someone throws a, a mattress out and no one deals with it. So you've got a big pile of rubbish. And then that same person comes back and throws a cigarette onto that mattress. Then you've got a fire. And then people turn around and go, what, why, who, who's responsible for this? Why did no one deal with this? And it's because the smaller issues weren't deal with, dealt with or talked about or acknowledged so bringing up and dealing with that smaller issues on a day-to-day -day basis is so important. So to, to, to finish my babble, self-awareness, first one, the, then the interactions with the others, which is like, what are you going to do with that fag butt? And then the interactions between the team, it's like, how did you get to that fire before you get to that fire type thing? So I think that's really, really I think we underestimate that day-to-day -day side, which then gets into the murky areas of culture. If we can deal with the day-to-day -day side, I think a huge amount of just the sort of collective improvement could be could be amazing. Thank you for that. That's really some great examples and reflections on, you know, how to make this into action for ourselves and for the teams that we work with. I think, you know, it would be actually really interesting for us to dive a little bit deeper and it may touch a bit on your third point, a little of, you know, receiving criticism and then talking through some of those steps. And in that, you know, various surveys have highlighted that aid workers generally don't report racist incidents and they, they don't think those things are handled very seriously. Do you believe this is something that also affects their ability to safely report security incidents? And, you know, if so, what can organizations do to ensure that they feel comfortable and confident in reporting these? Thanks for that. Yeah, thanks for that. Picking up on the feedback um, side as well. We as in AidWorks teamed up with uh, Sonia Elks from the from Thomas Reuters Foundation. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the report and the link to it. Um, that was, I guess, one of the reports that you, you, you might be talking about. And the, 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 the sort of the top four prevalent issues that that people reported were microaggressions, pay and benefits, actual racist sort of, you know, abuse and also uh, abilities to speak up. And I think they, w w that mixture of sort of microaggressions and being, you know, constantly being sort of demeaned, plus the fact that people are fearful of just speaking up, maybe fearful is not the right word, hesitant 
to speak up has to affect all parts of uh, parts of our work and that also links with psychological safety and how safe is the workplace and um to be able to voice your opinions and that that um and i think that's really really important to just to note and i think that's a, a big cultural issue that has to be dealt with and when i say culture this is so sort of one when the senior leaders and the and the safety and the security leaders are not looking what's going on when things are not looking when you're not in the room that's really what's being set as the culture um so the importance of this is so so important um, we also found in the in the um, survey that half of half of the incidents were never reported, and the first port of call was the manager. A third of uh, incidents were to first told to the manager. So how are we equipping? So beyond just the reporting, how are we equipping managers to have conversations with others when this comes up, or even before it comes up? So what we've seen work well outside of reporting. Because reporting, I feel, is just one aspect of it. It's almost like pressing the big red button and then the, the system will take over. But I think there's several layers to above that that need to be dealt with. And what we found have been successful with, with, with our partners, I'd say sort of four things. One, do an assessment, do an audit. Like what's the current situation at the moment? How it's almost like a cultural audit it's a combination of uh, dei and culture do an audit of what is going on how much do people feel like they can speak up how are jobs divided what are the feelings in meetings how included do they feel uh, within the organization that's worked really well to k- pick up the key levers of what needs to change um like for for one organization without going into details what they found was it, it was the onboarding process that had fallen to pieces so if they said sort the key lever was actually not more training it was like sort out your onboarding process when staff join they will feel much more secure about where their place is how they feel included and how they can work within the the workplace culture or how do they interact with that workplace culture the other thing we've seen useful is like employee resource groups so often that's talked about in terms of dei but that could be about security or any subject employee re- resource groups don't just have to be about deis like give a, a bunch of of your staff the mandate to do something uh, and choose what they're doing uh, give empower them to to make some decisions with some with a little bit of budget behind it as well the last two things i've, I've touched on sort of manager training training i don't want to say training support for them i think so like how i'm i'm a big believer of um, managers as coaches so imagine you know that small issues come up that you think can be solved oh that can be solved straight away you know go and do x but what an amazing coaching opportunity to make someone feel belong you know included um, if an issue come up that you already know what the answer is like to take that five minutes to coach them through to come up with their own answers it doesn't have to then be a big issue but a small issue to make them empowered like as a manager our job is to and a leader is to is to steer the staff we are mandated to lead but to give them the confidence to do their job not to take that away um, so that starts with the smaller stuff not rather the bigger stuff And I know there's a lot of talk about creating brave spaces. So that's the last thing about creating brave spaces. That doesn't have to be about big issues. It can be about smaller issues whilst people understand what what a brave space is. I've seen many organisations go down the town hall route and it's been catastrophic because it's been like so many issues have been hit into people's faces almost and it's an emotional journey that isn't being structured well and was that was that useful or not was that more hurtful and painful because going back to what psychological safe place uh, spaces are like you know what is what is going to be the retribution of that afterwards you can't quite tell it's really difficult so so you don't have to start with the big the big stuff to to set up safe or brave spaces to talk to each other and get into that rhythm of what that means and what that feels like. Really interesting. Thank you for that. I think, you know, just thinking and reflecting a bit on everything you've just shared, I'd love to talk to you about, you know, this issue of race and thinking a little bit maybe even about this brave spaces conversation and what you were just diving into and unpack it a little bit more. So, you know, many people in this aid sector are pretty uncomfortable speaking about issues of race and racism. Why do you think that's the case? And, you know, what are your thoughts on 
changing this? And does this fit a bit more into your brave space conversation a bit or unpack that a little bit more if you can? Can I ask you the same question again at the end? Is that is that okay? I'd love to hear your opinion as well after I answer. Would that, would that be okay, Tara? <laughs> That would be interesting, <laughs> and okay. I would be happy to explore some some reflection. Sure. Oh, awesome. I, I mean, I I don't know what it feels like to be a white person, so I don't I don't know completely what what that it is. But I do know what it feels like for me talking about race um, and bringing that up. I think there's elements of shame because I know I've got it wrong. I know I've I've treated at times like locally contract staff not as well as I should have done. Like I've made mistakes. I will own them. So there's shame, there's guilt as well. Um, just, you know, I do, you know, I'm privileged to be born in the UK. Um, um, British passport I, I allows me to have that, a, a lot more privileges than, than you know, if I had a South Sudanese passport. And I also think there's a probably a fear of getting things wrong. Those are the, the three things. Um, I remember, so, so you wanted, one of the things about uh, Brave Space, you, you know, talking from your own experience um, is very important. And so I found it really hard to bring up issues of race and racism. I remember the first time of like doing a, not the first time, so the first time I brought up, you know, we we're doing this due diligence processes for, for FCDO. And, you know, I, I put up, well, you know, can we ask for the DNI policy? Silence. There was silence on the on the team's call. Uh, it's like, but, but FCDO don't ask for it. It's like, but why can't we ask for it? So that was a perfect example. That it took me so long to have the, the courage just to ask that one question. And the first thing that I got was defensiveness. Now I realise I will always get defensiveness, and defensiveness is a sign that I'm I'm moving into uncomfortable space. If you're bringing something up with with someone bringing the courage up and the first thing you hear is uncomfortable uh, defensiveness that's a good thing that means you've just challenged someone's as you challenge the status quo you've challenged made the conversation uncomfortable for it to be defensive but that takes energy so so on that side from so so that side it's it's a it there is always going to be that side of and no one really feels like they're going wants to want to be uncomfortable so if you're leading uncomfortable conversations my my tip would be give yourself enough time before um to be prepared and be no you know be calm be ready for it and do something nice for yourself afterwards know that you've just done something that probably didn't work out the way that it were you know work out like i'll always i'll always try and you know go to the gym after a long workshop or because i know that's going to be a lot of energy that i need to need to get rid of so I think, yeah, going back to your point, I've got off the point a little bit. Sorry. Uh, so, and why is that? Because people don't like being, I don't think, uncomfortable and it's easier not to be. But for me, it's like one of the one of our core phrases in, in the innovation community is embrace the tension, embrace the unco- being uncomfortable. If it feels uncomfortable, it's probably the place to be. If you're feeling nervous, plus you're caring deeply at the same time, you're in the right space. If you're not feeling uncomfortable, if you're feeling What's the opposite of uncomfortable? Comfortable. If you're feeling comfortable, yeah, that you're not in the right space. You're not in the right place at all. So have I answered your question, Tara? Have I gone off the point? No, I think you've definitely, I think you've answered this question a bit. And I think it's it's telling. And I think it would be unfair for me not to respond to your question to me. <laughs> And I won't go into too much detail, but I will say that my positionality as a woman of color, a Black woman, American, Haitian American, my positionality definitely influences how I view and receive information, just like anyone else's background or positionality might influence how they view or receive information. And so when it comes to this uncomfortable, uncomfortable, and comfortable kind of space that you were referring to that really resonates with me and is a very big important factor to how I personally appreciate conversations when people are candid and honest about where they are in their process just as much as I would like to feel safe enough to be honest and candid of the issues that I'm working through and being able to to express that without you know fear of concern of of someone 
having some kind of retribution or something. So I think, you know, what you said definitely resonates with me personally and professionally. And so I appreciate that, that, that space to, to dialogue and the space to feel uncomfortable allows us to move things forward. So I appreciate you posing a question to me, but I'm going to take the questions back to you now. <laughs> I'd like to talk to you uh, and kind of stay on this conversation about racism and race, because I think it's really interesting opportunity for us as a, as a security community to really look at different things. So, you know, I'd love to hear more about your work um, and the work that your organization is doing to address issues of racism and how do your programs really kind of look and, and how do you really enable an organization that's working through this to to make this a lasting change, not just a, you know, we've checked the box, we spoke to Mo and Mo told us to do these things and we're good. So how do you actually move people beyond that and actually actionize some of the things that you're working with them on? Thanks. Thanks, Tara. And thanks for talking. I'll just pick up what you said about uh, candor and being be, uh, excited. I think you're what one of the things we've been now bringing more in because of the global situation like it, there's a lot of anxiety and and just energy draining at the moment it's like how like we're bringing in more about caring personally with candor to be more productive and effective at work because end of the day we, we do have jobs to do as well so i'm glad you talked about candor and we're bringing that in with with how to care pers personally and have candor so so thanks thanks for that um yeah no thank you uh, what, what like this there's, there's several things that we're we're trying to do and i i, I must admit i don't know if we're going to have lasting change it's a bit early i reckon but on, on a personal level i'm privileged enough to be the advisor uh, inverted commas for um the international development committee's uh inquiry into racism and aid so so personally i'm trying to do some trying to look at that sort of higher level like you know trying to trying to push forward what we can put recommendations to to fcdo themselves about changes but the the organization stuff is more interesting to be honest it's much more interesting it's much more personal like it's more more you know working with individuals so what we're trying to do is take that coaching approach so on an individual level with we're, 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 we're coaching leaders um it's not about how to be anti-racist it's about inclusive leadership and that then takes an anti-racism lens to it all so it's a combination of tools bringing to bringing tools to them talking through their issues because you know right now we literally only see a small frame of people's lives it's you know it literally hits the zoom we don't know what quite is going on so getting working with leaders to work with their staff is really important and the other side is that we run programs not workshops with with organizations so taking them we don't run one-off workshops um so anyone that comes to us and says can you run a three-hour workshop we'll talk through them saying what the you know there's clear evidence showing and i can i'll include that in the show notes that that such workshops have have like one or two days of impact and that's it and then they start just you know so so turn forcing people to do bias training has one or two days versus interest but engage calling in managers to run on programs of change is a is a, a bit more of a different approach that we take over say four or five months so a series of calls and prompts and engagements and a lot of that is about building psychological safety a lot about that is getting to know your staff about seeing people as human beings and learning about what you know their views are and engaging on on that whole feedback side um, and we create that sort of space we're not refereeing but it's almost like you know pe people know they're not in the workspace if that makes sense so so they they know that not we are watching you but they know that you know that you know it's like you act slightly differently don't you when when uh, when there's when and we're trying to bring that in over time because then we have a bit more of a late lasting time so at the moment we're running uh, two three three core programs for organizations one's called courageous conversations which is pretty cool of like getting organizations to do what we say have co courageous conversations um the other is uh, power privilege race and inclusion very snappy title um uh, so working through day-to-day -day inclusion power privilege and race and having some really tough conversations about white supremacy culture 
um so uh, yeah that's that uh, yeah so that again why we do it over time because it's quite like that was quite heavy and then you've got to go back to work again like you don't like so so let's like break it up a little bit so so it's a little bit easier to take in and the last one is we run it's called unleashing your inner leader which is all about inclusive leadership because we consider everyone to be a change maker and leader so so really giving them i wouldn't there's i wouldn't say tools but how, giving them the framework to to work through their own way of being an inclusive leader and again about like self-reflection and working with others and then work and then bringing that taking that back to their team so that's pretty exciting and we've, we've got one running for an organization in a couple of weeks time and, and an open one for anyone to join so a lot of this we're trying to hit at the organizational level the the leaders level which is everyone either in groups or in or in individuals because i don't think anyone has all the answers um so this yeah so we're trying to we're just trying to meet people where they're at and take them through where they're ready to take that uncomfortable journey. Um, but half of it is everyone doing the hard work together. And that's been pretty, pretty cool to, to, to see how that's coming through on a, on a, on a day-to-day basis uh, for, for the, for all the individuals we're working with. So it's pretty exciting. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts a bit on white privilege and that term and kind of unpacking how, you know, what you think about white privilege and how this might come up in in aid organizations, but also with regards to physical and psychological safety. There are no easy questions, are there, today? So this is uh, so. No, no. Thanks, thanks, thanks for that. Which is good because it's it's about uncomfortable conversations. I'll send you a link to an awesome John Amici video on on white privilege he did for for the BBC, which he does a very good job. I think there's. There is nothing but benefit from all of us understanding our privilege. There's nothing but benefit from that. If we can get over the guilt and sh- any guilt, size or shame, but there's no, there's anything, there's, there's always going to be benefit of understanding where our privilege lies with, with regards to other people. Let's start with all privilege. All privilege is, is about the absence of an inconvenience. So you may not notice it on a day-to-day basis. So for a, a silly example, I've got a British passport, brilliant, you know, gets me everywhere. But, you know, with my name, Muhammad Ali, suddenly that privilege is taken away and on, on certain borders. And I only notice the lack of that privilege when it's taken away from me. The rest of the time, I'm like, I wouldn't even know where my passport is right now. So it's just very silly examples of when it's taken away, then I've noticed it. And there's lots and lots of types of privilege out there and unpacking what that is for you that what 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 is present and what is what is not so present is really really important and the idea of white privilege i think is that it's not it's not that you know the word means that white people haven't suffered or aren't suffering or don't deserve the success it just means that the color of the skin hasn't impeded them in some way or form and that's very difficult to to delineate to separate from other types of privilege but you know the stats are out there um, in the UK. Apologies, for using a UK example. This week, there's been a report out that um, black children are twice as more likely to be in poverty in the UK than white children. So obviously, there's 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 lots of different things at play there. But there is an element of of white privilege there in terms of that situation. So unpacking it is so important. I hope that helps. Uh, there were there were some other questions at the end of what white privilege is. Uh, so please feel feel free to to repeat them. Sure, I think it's you know that's really helpful for you to describe that, and I think it's interesting for us to understand how this affects the aid community and how this might show up in in an organization, and also how it might play into staff physical and or psychological safety. Yeah, no, no, brilliant. I think this also links with perhaps how, if we're going to quote, coin a phrase, internationally contracted staff are, are treated versus locally contracted staff. If you're okay with me using those terms, you're nodding. So I hope, I hope that's okay. I think there are elements of how um, people are treated differently from where they are. And that is all mixed up together, isn't there? There is clearly a recruitment bias going on. So I've never been tested. So so why do we test our locally led, locally contracted staff? Like I've never had a written test. So why are we giving out 
written tests to i'd probably have failed my first written test on how to write you know a proposal or something so so like just the little thing there that's um representation in the uk representation in terms of the different dimensions of diversity and and different uh, ethnicities is definitely an issue you know we have a very white uh, sector in the uk in the uk the contracting and remuneration process is certainly different and there's a lot of debate about what that what that means uh, mobility of staff i i can pretty much work anywhere can't we can't i and the thing when i was thinking about you know the ability to work everywhere it's like why why have why after uh, what you know the if we if we treat the, the aid sector you know really flourishing it would be the start of the end of the colonial era it really flourished you know it started to really so why haven't we seen sort of locally led staff now ceos in the uk why haven't we seen more over 50 plus years something's going going on there in terms of how how it, it about privilege where we've started and unearned privilege where we've started and where we've ended up you know i can go from intern to ceo but can a South Sudanese staff member do the same? So there's something on there about about how we're doing, how we're yeah to unpack how and there's a myriad of reasons and barriers, but we have to question about how we've done a how many generations of aid workers if we're going to have the term aid, aid workers, how many generations have we gone through two, three, four type thing? So there's it's really I think playing out and representation does matter. I think representation does matter in in how we have an outlook on on the future uh, work that we do. Can I ask you about that a little bit more, which is, you know, do you have examples or reflections on how race, ethnicity and racism affect an aid worker's security? Again, sort of talking from my own experience, I'm proud of this, but, you know, how we've uh, treated uh, staff during evacuations has been very, very different. So I evacuated out of South Sudan during the troubles in 2013 i don't quote me on 2013 it was it was it might be 2016 and you know there was you know all of that stuff sorted out and my you know the uh, south sudanese staff you know they took a bus to uganda they were just all you know we waited to you know so or or got got so how does that make sense so you know they've got to sort of make their own way and i i i know there's arguments for and against and through it all but it did feel slightly strange that that situation happening so that would probably be like the one that really resonates but i think it's a, if we don't look at how people are treated equally how do we expect them to be then coming forward and coming being part of the organization and part of the culture and bringing up issues when they need to be brought up they're not perceiving themselves to be equal if that makes sense yeah and so tell me do you ever feel like in your experience in in working in this community for some time that your personal racial ethnic makeup was at all a contributing factor to any risks that you experienced or or you know who you are may have been a factor in your safety or have you ever observed an instance where someone else's background and racial or ethnic makeup may have impacted their safety while working in this community? I felt like I've had more veto in the past of what I can do and not do. Um, so I felt like if I felt insecure, I was able to speak up more than more than it, um, more than uh, the locally uh, contracted staff because of my power behind things. And my privilege of being an international staff member so i think that sort of has come up for me it was like I, f I feel like i i have the safety to say and, and no fear of repercussion saying well, i'm not doing that i'm not going there i think on my personal sort of level i think it, it's been much more nuanced about the level of microaggressions and and a day-to-day -day side of things that really stop you to stop being part of saying, well, I'm not going to speak up, or I'm not going to do something, which has detrimental ripple effects on how everything is handled, including how uh, safety and security is led. So if I'm feeling like that, who has some for a person of privilege is feeling like that, uh, dread to think people with less power in an organisation, how they're feeling about bringing stuff up. 
so that's sort of sort of what springs to mind i'm getting nods a lot nods from you you can't see this on the on the call people listening to this but the tara is nodding nodding at me which is which is uh which is affirming yes i am nodding i appreciate your thoughts there um you know do you have any recommendations for security managers on how to ensure that they manage security risks in an inclusive way well, I think it comes back to basics, like how are you handling yourself with everyone? Like, are you actually treating everyone the same? How are decisions being made? We go through this, we have an exercise on like, well, how are your decisions being made? Who is around the table? Who's represented? I think if I was going to give around one piece of advice, it's like just pause, notice, and perhaps journal. Uh, what's going on around you to start unpicking it talk to yourself one of the best ways of getting into inclusive conversations is have one with yourself first of what's going on what's really going on i think we because of the hustle of our work and especially security managers and security leaders who are dealing with a sharp end of issues and incidents like we're rushing from space to space so pause can you find 20 minutes in your diary every day if you can't find 10 can you find 10 if you can't find 10 perhaps a break's needed so you can't find 10 minutes in your diary in a day just to pause and reflect on what's going on around you make a huge difference that self-awareness side and over time there'll just be a huge ripple effect um, the other side is start connecting with people start connecting with people outside your organization start talking about this again talking with yourself, talking with others, vocalizing what you're seeing and what's resonating uh, will make a huge difference. Uh, um, I'm, I'm a firm believer that everyone everyone needs a coach. Everyone should have someone that they are going to be sort of half accountable to and meet up regularly to talk about your challenges, push your organizations to have a coach. I mean, we did this poll in the innovation community, only 25% or so, a quarter of members had access to a coach within the, you know, so we're not giving that sort of sport to, to managers uh, and leaders within our organizations. It seems to be more prevalent for senior leaders, but I think everyone, everyone, everyone could, could do, do, with a, do, do with a bit of coaching, especially right now uh, in how flux the world is. Really interesting. Thank you for that. I think, you know, you've shared so many interesting points for us to really walk away with that I actually want to ask you, is there other things that we should be thinking about? Do you have other things that you'd like to leave us with today that we haven't had a chance to talk about or anything that you think, you know, we really need to make sure that we emphasize that? I don't think so. I'd throw it back to yourself. Like, was there anything, one thing that you would say is like, why well, I hadn't thought of that before. I wouldn't be a coach to ask you what your takeaway was. So was the one thing that you took away, if you don't mind talking about it, Tara? I took a lot away today. And I think our listeners have also taken quite a bit away. And, you know, one thing you did say is this idea of daring to lead. And I think that's that's a really good point for us to really reflect on and how we're all kind of leaders within ourselves. And I just appreciated that. And I think that speaks well within the security landscape as well as a lot of it is important for us to be reflective on how we can do our part to make sure that we're creating safe and inclusive operations, but keeping ourselves and, and our colleagues safe while also delivering the important aid that, that many of us are, are working on here. So I think, you know, I'd love just to give you a chance to share any final thoughts or anything else you'd like to leave us with. Well, I think you, you, you nailed it there, which is like, you know, I think don't look for there is not going to be don't wait for an overhaul of a system you know the system is made of people people are made of actions actions are made of thoughts and that starts with the individual so every time we do that every time we make a change we'll have that ripple effect don't underestimate it don't underestimate it so the mass sort of you know managing director comes in new strategy new blah 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 like by the time the new managing director comes in that oh, that strategy is probably not going to finish being done. So, you know, don't wait for that. Start start doing the basics, start, start doing yourself. And I think you'll find that a lot of this uh, will actually ripple effect into your own lives as well. I feel like a much more inclusive parent because I focus on inclusive leadership. Oh, what did my son, my son came up with a great phrase this week, which is like, he turned around, I just said, oh, you could do this and this. And just turned around and said, dad, there's always more than two options. Wow. That's powerful. You're preparing the next generation. Very nice. <laughs> well, 
Well, I really have appreciated you taking the time to speak with us and, and share your thoughts. And we, we look forward to learning more and we'll make the resources that you've mentioned available as well within the, you'll be able to, to find them as part of the resources in this episode. And we really just are looking forward to continuing this dialogue and conversation forward. So thank you so much for being with us. Now. Thanks for taking the time, Tara. Have a great one. The Global Interagency Security Forum is a member-led NGO with a global network of over 130 member organizations and affiliates. We are committed to achieving sustainable access for populations in need through improved safety and security for aid workers and operations. GISF's original research, collaboration, and events drive positive change in security risk management across the humanitarian sector. We operate according to the humanitarian principles and lead on best practices and in innovation by pushing for a collaborative and inclusive approach to security risk management. doing the world's most important work are up against the biggest challenges. Since the 90s, security incidents involving NGOs have increased as their independence and impartiality no longer protect them. Humanitarians are actively targeted as well as exposed to the risks of conflict and disaster, facing kidnapping, injury and death in order to help those in need. And the threats to their safety means their ability to help diminishes too. NGOs began to create roles for dedicated security professionals, but they often lacked support and resources and worked in isolation. In 2006, a group of them from the UK and Ireland got together to develop coherent approaches to security risk management in the humanitarian space, eventually becoming an established network, the European Interagency Security Forum. With a strategic, inclusive and collaborative focus, the forum has created a centre of excellence, facilitates a peer-to-peer -peer network, builds capacity for security risk management and provides a voice for practitioners reaching over a hundred members. In response to growing demand, it has now gone global, bringing different perspectives, expertise and resources to make core activities such as original research, trainings, workshops and knowledge sharing more impactful than ever. As a result, organizations are able to build their security risk management on an even stronger foundation to keep more aid workers safe and enable sustainable access to communities in need. With a vision to see the work of the whole third sector done more effectively by supporting NGOs around the world, we are the Global Interagency Security Forum.